Amen. So you're going to bookmark Romans chapter number one, and we're going to get there in just a few minutes. So we're continuing um, our Daniel 70th week sermon series. This is the seventh sermon in this series. So if you remember um, from the beginning, I just want to recap. If you've got the chart sitting in front of you, let's recap where we've come from. We're talking about the end time seven year period. The Daniel 70th week prophecy from Daniel chapter number nine. We're looking at um, a simple pattern of events that is going to take place um, in the end times. So the end times is this Daniel 70th week. You know, the Bible has, you know, two different things. That could, Jesus talks about the last days. Um, where Jesus said that e even in his time, we're in the last days. But what we're talking about specifically in this sermon series is the end times, where that's the last seven-year period. If you look down at your chart, you'll see that, you know, there's a lot of false things taught about this. Um, and look, we don't know everything about every detail about how this is all going to go down. That's why um, many times throughout um, the sermon series, I'll tell you like, well, maybe this is what I think or this is my opinion. But the pattern and series of events is clear. The milestones and the clues that we will see is clearly laid out in the Bible. What comes before um, what and what comes after um, these milestones and clues, um, especially the milestones, is very detailed. So first of all, we'll start out with the Antichrist coming on the scene. This is something where, you know, we're not going to miss this. Some world leader is going to come on the scene. He's going to make a covenant with many, the Bible says, um, in the book of Daniel. And he is then going to enter into this ascent to global power that, as we see in Revelation chapter number six, you know, takes um, form in these four horses of the apocalypse, as people, you know, commonly call these basically through this massive world war that is going to cause um, death over a quarter of the earth. You know, that's going to be, you know, if we look at the earth's population now, you're looking at about 2 billion people will die in the Antichrist's, you know, claim to global power. I don't think we're going to miss that. All right. That's not something where, you know, you're going to put your phone away for the, for the month of June and just miss that happening. All right. We're talking about massive global war, Definitely, in my opinion, um, nuclear war on a, on a decent global scale um, to cause that kind of destruction and death. But after that time, then the Antichrist will be at his global power. The tribulation of Christians has been going on during um, this whole period where the Antichrist is rising to global power. At that point, he sets himself, he makes himself a god. He sets up an image of himself in the temple which doesn't exist yet, by the way. And then he demands that people worship that image. And that is, of course, the marker, the abomination of desolation that starts, you know, he demands people take a mark and worship the image, the mark of the beast, and Christians will not take it. They will not worship the beast. And, of course, that ushers in the Great Tribulation, which is this shorter period of time, which is several weeks long. And, you know, if it wasn't shortened, the Bible says that no Christian would survive, all right? Nobody would make it. And then, of course, that is cut. That is at the center of the week, so that's three and a half years in since the Antichrist rose to power, made that covenant with many, took over the world through war. Then we see the rapture comes. You know, Jesus comes back in the clouds. He raptures us to heaven. That is the first resurrection, as the Bible says, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we all go to heaven um, with Jesus. And then after that, after the space of just a few minutes, the Bible says, God begins to pour out his wrath upon the earth. All right. So that's what we're talking about um, in the last couple of sermons is this wrath of God, the second half of this seven year period. So this wrath is three and a half years long. We're looking at these trumpets. Of course, the, the book of Revelation is cut from chapter number one to chapter number 11 and then chapter number 12 to chapter number 22, they kind of go parallel with each other. And hopefully you can see that very clearly now when we look at how the trumpets and the vials match up. So we're looking at Revelation chapter 8 that has the angel sounding the trumpet. Then we're looking at the matching vial. So the trumpet is kind of the announcement of the wrath of God, and the vial contains the actual wrath being poured out. So we looked at the first three vials and the first three trumpets so far where God has basically poured out his wrath upon uh, the first was the earth itself. He burned up a third of the trees and all of the grass. I mean, think about that. 
um, for a few minutes, you know, just how, what that would look like on the earth, just the, the massive destruction of that. This is after the massive war in Revelation chapter number six, but we're looking at, you know, a third of the trees and all of the grass on the earth burned up. And then after that, we see in the second and third vials and trumpets, we see the judgment of, you know, the wrath poured upon the waters of the earth. And that's what we talked about last week. So, you know, a third of the fish in the sea died. You know, this great star comes from heaven and poisoned. So we see the sea poisoned. We see the rivers and the fountains poisoned. Basically, all the waters of the earth are cursed or poisoned, or that's where the wrath was um, poured out. All right. Now, in the fourth, in the fourth trumpet and fourth vial, we're going to see God's wrath poured out upon the sun, moon, and stars, specifically the sun. All right, look at verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. So there's, you know, there's a six-minute recap for you, and hopefully that catches you up to anything that you may have missed. Um, but I just kind of want to repeat that to you so you can... It's not that complicated. I mean, there's just several things that need to happen in order um, for the Bible to match up to what's going to happen. All right, look at Revelation chapter 16. Then we're going to go to Revelation chapter 8. Let's look at the fourth vial... And then we'll look at the fourth trumpet. So remember, the vial contains the wrath of God, and the trumpet is kind of announcing that wrath being poured out. But we, it's kind of neat. We get to see, just like gospel accounts, we get to see kind of two different accounts of what happens. And we see very similar things um, in the fourth vial and the fourth um, trumpet, or I should say in Revelation 16 and Revelation chapter 8, kind of proving this theory that these, um, the Revelation is kind of cut up and, and set next to each other in chronological order. All right, look at verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 16. The Bible says this, it says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now flip over to Revelation chapter number 8, if you would. Let's go to Revelation chapter number 8 and see if we can see a, a similarity here. Revelation chapter 8, look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12 of Revelation chapter 8. So in verse number 8 of Revelation 16, we see that the vial was poured out on the sun. But look at verse 12 of Revelation 8. It says, And the fourth angel sounded... And the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and day shone not for a third part of it, and night likewise. So here we see some more detail here in Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 12, where it says literally the, the sun was smitten, it was, it was changed, or, or, you know, damaged or something by God. And a third part of it was smitten. And, of course, we know the moon doesn't actually give light. It just reflects the light of the sun. So that makes sense that um, it, would, it would be, a th you know, if the moon if the sun was by a third, it would make sense that the sun and the stars were darkened by a third. I don't know if the stars themselves were darkened by a third or not, um, or if it was just the sun um, doing that. But the Bible says that this affects the, the heavens, the things that, are, um, that we're looking at in the sky in the universe. All right. So a third part of them was darkened, and day shone not for a third part of it, and night likewise. So it's saying that like the days were a, a, a third as bright, or a third shorter, or, or I actually don't know exactly how that works. You know, the Bible doesn't clearly um, tell us how that's going to work, but if the sun is smitten, that is definitely going to affect us. All right, the sun is um, super important to us. As a matter of fact, it's proof of creation. I mean, if there is any proof of creation at all, it is the fact that, you know, we are in this exact spot where, you know, we can, there could only be life if we were basically right here where we are. You know, the, the earth is like 93 mi million miles away from the sun. And if it was even just, to, if you think about the distance, you ever seen like a picture of the solar system and you think about the distance to the sun from the earth. And then you look at like the distance from the moon to the earth. And the moon is like, you know, right next to the earth when it comes to like that kind of distance. I, I didn't look up how far away the moon is, but it's, it's tiny compared to our distance from the sun. If we were just four times as close to, if you just take the distance from the earth to the moon, take that times four and then move 
closer to the, to the sun or moves away from the sun that distance, there would be no life on Earth. So that's how exact we are at this location. You know, you just look at like the next planet, which is furthest away away from the sun from us, which is Mars, all right? And this is like, this is why like Elon Musk like kind of drives me nuts a little bit. Like I, you know, I, I don't mind the guy, but Mars is 171 million miles away from, from the sun. So we're 93, Mars is the next planet away from the sun. It's 171 million miles, all right? So about double, you know, the distance from the sun, and Mars is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, like average temperature, okay? So, you know, when you talk about like colonizing Mars or something like that, it's like, it's like one of the most, like getting there is like, I mean, yeah, well, say we could get there, but I mean, getting there maybe isn't impossible, but once you're there, like you're dead. So, you know, I, I don't know, you know, Elon Musk has some, he does some good things. And, you know, I, I kind of talk about the guy, you know, I think he's a smart guy and all that, but it would be more feasible to, you know, make a, 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 a settlement on the, the ocean floor at the deepest part of the ocean than it would to colonize Mars. Or let's colonize Antarctica. That would be a better idea, right, than going out to Mars. Because it's not just, it's, it's not just the, well, I'll get there in a second, but let's look at the one that's closest to the sun. All right, so here we are, the Earth. We've got Mars that's a little further away. And then a little further, who knows what planet is closest to the sun from us? It's Venus, right? So Venus is the one that is 67 million miles away. So we're 93. Venus is 67 million miles away from the sun. And it has a temperature of 867 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so that's like hotter than any oven that we have, right? So you can't, the point is we're at the exact spot we need to be. And the point is that, another point is this, especially with Mars and inhabiting Mars, it's not just like the temperature that we're talking about. I mean, it's the atmosphere, it's the percentage of oxygen that's perfect for our bodies, it's the percentage of all the different chemicals in the air, the fact that, you know, the, the soil on Mars is poisonous, like, I don't know. So, like, even if they do find an ice crystal on Mars, I mean, what is it? So? You know, it's 80 degrees, minus 80 degrees below zero, and it, the whole planet and atmosphere is basically poisonous. So, you know, I don't know. We're at the perfect spot. And it's not even just the weather. It's not even just the temperature. It's the soil. It's the seasons. It's the water system. It's the weather. It's the humidity. It's everything that is perfect here. How could anyone look at that, and that's exactly what Romans 1 is talking about before it gets into what we're going to talk about tonight. How could anybody look at that, all these details, and then say, oh yeah, you know, it, it, it all exploded and here we are, right? I mean, it makes no sense of all. Instead of worrying how fragile, you know, all of the ecosystem is, we should actually just be amazed Instead of being like worried about, oh, it's so fragile that we're going to break it or tip it or something, we should be amazed how stable it is. We should be amazed at how perfect the design of not only nature, but the entire universe is. I mean, that should amaze any thinking person, right? And by, that, by the way, that's what the Bible says the heavens are there. They're, they're there to declare how amazing, you know, declare the what? The glory of God, Amen. all right? So in Revelation chapter 16, in Revelation chapter number 8, we see God himself messing with this balance. We see God himself, you know, taking and changing the sun and changing the stars and affecting the moon. Look at Revelation chapter number 11, if you would. Now, it's interesting, I don't know if you followed exactly the similarities between Revelation chapter 16 and Revelation chapter 8, but we see that a third of the moon is smitten, or a third of the sun is smitten, meaning the sun is damaged to not give light, you know, by a third, whatever that is. Or, you know, energy, um, light is just part of what comes from the sun. We have this great energy um, source from the sun. But, and then we see in Revelation chapter 16 that men are burned with great heat. You know, I mean, look, that's, there's your global warming right there, all right? This is like real global warming, all right? Men are burned with, they're scorched with great 
heat. Now, how does that work where the sun is smitten and then man? I mean, you would think it would get colder, but how does that look? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. God doesn't say how that's going to happen, but he says what's going to happen. So that's what we take by faith. But look at Revelation chapter 11, verse number 3. And I know we haven't talked about the two witnesses yet, and I'll have a whole sermon on that in a couple weeks. But look at verse number 3, just a similarity. I don't know if this is something that is um, similar to what is going to happen in Revelation 16 or Revelation chapter 8. But look at verse number 3. It says, I'll give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's about three and a half years, by the way, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So these two guys, and we'll talk about who they may or may not be um, in a couple weeks, but they're going to have the ability to pour fire out from their mouths and burn people up that try to hurt them. But in Revelation chapter 16 and in Revelation chapter 8, where this event happens to the sun, the moon, and the stars, the Bible is going to, the Bible's saying men are burned up from the heat of this event. So it's not like, you know, they're burned up from the heat of this angel and this event that happens to the sun, moon, and stars. All right, so will this be, I mean, this is just a thought of mine, by the way. Will this be permanent? I don't think so. I don't think that this will be permanent because of the fact of what I told you last week that, you know, this is the same earth that Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning, and we are going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ during the thousand-year reign, during the millennial reign of Christ. It's the same earth. So probably not going to be permanent. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have to do some, you know, resizing of AC units and probably the entire power grid around the earth, all right, if this is something that is permanent, all right? But go back to Revelation chapter number 16. So we see this great event happen, all right? Whatever, um, however form it takes or however the mechanics of it um, work out, look at Revelation chapter number 16, you know, and just look at verse number nine. Let's look at verse number nine here, and I just want to point something out here. We're going to spend the rest of the sermon focusing on this detail. But the Bible says, and men were scorched with great heat, and blaspheme the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now, for, I would think that a lot of people, maybe not this crew here, but I would think that a lot of people who consider themselves Christian and read that and they accept the Christianity of today, they would be very confused by that verse. Because here you have God doing this extreme thing to the sun, which is causing this heat, and men are literally being burned up and killed because of this heat. And what are they doing to the person? And they know, look, the Bible says, the God which hath power over these plagues. So imagine someone is harming you and has power over you to give a plague. And when the Bible says plague, it's not talking about, um, you know, sick necessarily just sickness or anything like that. It could be any kind of judgment that God is pouring down upon the earth. It could be sickness, but it could be hail, it could be fire, it could be any kind of thing that God is pouring out upon the earth is considered a plague. But what are these men doing? What are they doing to the one that they know has power over that is causing the plague? What are they doing? They're cursing God. They're cursing God. They're, you know, blaspheming him. They are, they're, they're not getting right. These men here in verse number nine, I mean, I used to be really into um, like apologetics, especially apologetics through like archaeology. I mean, I used to be really interested in this, and I mean like 20 some years ago. I used to be able to, I used to think that, man, if we could just find the Ark of the Covenant, if we could just find, mainly, the main one was like Noah's Ark, right? If we could just find Noah's Ark, then everyone will believe. Everyone will believe in God. I mean, it's a silly thought, I mean, now. But I was thinking that if people could just see the proof somehow of the Bible, the proof somehow of what God said in the Bible, that men would just believe at that point. But the problem that I had was basically the Bible is the problem I had because men believe with the heart, not with the head. This is the problem, right? For with the heart, men believe unto righteousness not with the head. 
And that's the issue. So people, you know, I mean, you look at all things like, you know, Answers in Genesis and, you know, the Creation Museum. And I remember we even took the kids to the Creation Museum many, many years ago. Which, look, it's cool to see how, like, the ark was real and, like, actually all the animals could have fit on there. And it's not some mythical story. And it's a neat thing to kind of maybe um, show children that, like, this isn't, a, this isn't a cartoon. This is real. This is what happened. This is history. But it's not going to, you know, get people saved. You know, the gospel is what people need to hear to be saved. And it's not like if they had, you know, head knowledge, you know, all, look, there's a problem with the heart if people don't accept the gospel. Not that they need more proof in their head, right? The gospel not being accepted by somebody is a problem here, not here, all right? But look, look at this verse in verse number nine. This shows us that not only does, you know, proof of the Bible not matter. Look, these people know that God is doing this to them. These people know so well who is putting this plague down upon them, and it says a very similar thing with the fifth vial that comes out. They again are cursing God. They know who is doing it. It's not like they're getting, you know, burned up with heat and scorched with fire, and they're like, how is this happening? No, they are cursing and blaspheming God himself. And that shows you that men, look, you don't believe there are people that hate God? That is exactly what the Bible is talking about here. It is talking about people who know who God is. They know who is doing what's happening to them. And look, they, they never will believe because they hate the Lord. Turn to Romans chapter number one. Turn to Romans chapter number one. And it's interesting because the very last phrase of verse number 9 in Revelation chapter 16 is that they repented not to what? They repented not to give him glory. It didn't say they didn't know who he was. It didn't say they didn't know that there was a God or not a God. It said they would not give God glory. This is exactly what Romans chapter 1 is talking about. Turn over to Romans chapter 1. If you're there, let me turn there myself. Romans chapter 1 is talking about these types of people. And look, folks, they've always existed. These types have always been there. Start out at verse number 20, if you would. And for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They see the sun, the moon, and the stars. They see nature around them. They see the fountains of waters. They see the trees and the grass and the animals being understood by, all thi by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody has any excuse because we can all see the creation. Because that when they knew God, look at this, exactly as Revelation 16, 9 says, they glorified him not as God. What was the problem? Does it say when they, when it, does it say when they didn't know who God was or they, they were atheists? No, it says they knew God. They knew God. They knew what his word said. They knew who he was but they would not give him the glory. Just like verse number 9 of Revelation 16. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagin imaginations, and they're foolish. Look at this. They're foolish. What was darkened? Their mind was darkened? No. First, their heart was darkened. This is what was darkened first. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed, here's that word again, and changed the glory. It's just they, they really have a problem with giving God glory. They really have a problem with nature and creation giving God glory. You'll see a lot of really wicked people that worship creation, that worship animals. But by worshiping animals and elevating them to many times above people, what are they doing? They're not giving God glory. They're worshiping the earth. They are worshiping the creation itself, which is what the Bible is talking about. Change the glory of the incorruptible, uncorruptible God into an image made like unto a corruptible man, into birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, now we see God step in. Wherefore, meaning this is, you know, for this reason. God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So God starts to let them go, the Bible says who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And again, verse 16, for this cause, for this reason, because they didn't give God the glory, just like Revelation 16, 9. 
They would not give God the glory. For this reason, God gave them up unto vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. Don't think that you have to go and explore every perversion that is coming out every single year in this country and this world. All you need to understand is that only men and women together in marriage is natural. Everything else, every other affection is vile, and every other affection is unnatural. Amen. You don't have to explore and educate yourself on what all these new words that people are creating mean. All you have to know is that there is only two categories. One is natural, and the other is unnatural. Look at verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The heart started first to do those things which are not convenient. Because if the heart was right, the mind, and I'll prove this to you from the Bible. I'm going to show you the, the anti-reprobate verse in the Bible. Because if the heart is right, the mind will never go there. If the heart is right, it will never lead the mind into all these unnatural things. Gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Another word for convenient is what? Natural. Look at verse number 29. Being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters. Don't miss this one. Haters of God. They hate the Lord. They hate the Lord in Revelation chapter 16 in verse number 9. God is burning them up with heat and they hate him for it. Look, folks. These are not atheists. These are not secular humanists. These are not even agnostics. These are people that know there's a God. And they hate him. They know what he wants. They know what he teaches. They know who he is. They know what he did. And they reject it all. They will not give him the glory for anything. They know what he offers. And they don't want it. And not only that, not only do they reject it, but they hate him for it. And guess what? Turn to Psalm chapter 11 and verse number 5. He hates them back. He hates them back. And he gives them over for this cause, because of this. For this reason. It is very clear, folks. Look at Psalm chapter 11. Psalm chapter 11 and look at verse number 5. Psalm chapter 11, verse number 5. The Bible says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. That's right. God has given these people over. They hated him first is the key. And for this reason, he gave them over. But the point is this, folks. This is in Paul's letter to the Romans. And Paul is explaining this to us. But this has always existed is what we need to see. And it's going to exist in the end times as well. I mean, God loves everybody is a nice little catchphrase until you start to think about it for more than three seconds. I mean, it doesn't make sense on, I mean, not only is it just not true, as I just showed you from the Bible, but it doesn't make any sense on any level. I mean, we have an entire month in this country celebrating something that God says is an abomination that he hates. I mean, but is it a surprise? No, it's, it's not a surprise. Because it's always been going on. It's going to be even existing when God is pouring out his wrath on this earth. It will be no different at all. Right? So look, apologetics and all these things trying to prove your faith to people, it has their place. But look, the problem is, with this crowd, they, they knew God. They knew God and they hated him. So it's just a reality. It's just a reality of people that are going to exist on this earth, just like you know, Christians are going to be existing at all points in time with people that hate God. It's a reality. And look, what does that mean for us, though? What that means for us is, is this. We're not after those people. We're not after those people. We're not, you know, I mean, you got these Christians that are, that are going to, 
uh, pride parades today, you know, waving around Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter number five. Turn to Ephesians chapter number five. But look, we're not interested in that crowd. We're not after, um, I'm not there to preach the Bible to those people. They, they knew God. And they hate him. They've already made that decision. Look at Ephesians chapter number five. Ephesians chapter number five, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. It is a shame to speak of all these perversions and all these different things. It is a shame to even talk about it, the Bible says. I mean, much less go and look at it. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. You shouldn't have that in front of your eyes. You shouldn't have anything to do with it. Stay away from it. You don't have to learn about it. You're the pastor, though. I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to know anything about it. I know what it is. I know where it came from. I know the cause of it. I'm not confused. I'm, uh, unnatural is all I need to know. Amen. Turn to Philippians chapter number four. See, the key for us is we are after the ones that they're after. Yeah. Yep. We are after the ones that they're after. We just had a whole sermon this morning on children. We are after the children with the word of God. We are after the children with Jesus Christ. We are after the children with the truth. Look, it's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual war for the hearts of those in the middle, especially the children. I mean, look, this, this God loves everybody doesn't make sense on any level at, at all. I mean, would God love those who try to destroy and confuse and abuse children? Would God, would God love that? How could that be possible? When you have a, a, a third, a third of, of the youngest generation in this country who doesn't know whether they're a boy or a girl or what that implies, and, and you have that kind of abuse being per perpetrated on so many people, I mean, God, God loves those people that would do that. What sense does that make? And plus, the Bible just clearly teaches against it. They need Jesus before confusion. You want to see the opposite of Romans 1 in the Bible? Look at Philippians chapter 4. Look at Philippians chapter number 4. And look at verse number 7. What, in Isaiah chapter 54 from this morning, what will children have that are taught of the Lord? What will they have? They'll have peace. You know what's not peace? You know what the opposite of peace is? Confusion. And, 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 and wrath of God abiding upon you and, and just like living out God's wrath like in real time in your life. Being confused about everything from, you know, just like being, taking your natural state and having that all confused and, and being exposed to wicked people. Look, that's the opposite of peace. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7. It says, In the peace of God, which passeth, passeth all understanding, shall keep your what? your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. These kids need to be saved. These kids need to be saved, and then God promises us in the Bible that he will, instead of giving their hearts over, instead of, instead of what is it? Instead of their foolish hearts being darkened, he says, I will keep their hearts. And instead of giving them over to a reprobate mind, he will keep their minds. It's literally the opposite of Romans chapter 1. This is somebody who has loved God, who has looked at the gospel, has accepted the gospel, has trusted Jesus Christ. And God says, if that has happened, I will keep your heart and your mind. That's the opposite of darkening your heart. That's the opposite of giving over your mind. A child that gets saved will never be given over to a reprobate mind. Very simple. That's why it's so important when we're out soul winning. Like, you ever run into somebody, you're out soul winning, and you run in, I do this all the time. You're out soul winning, and you run into some, some kids on the street or whatever, maybe they're 12, 13 years old, or, or you know, whatever, and you're not comfortable as a, a couple guys talking, maybe they're younger girls or whatever, you just go get the ladies and bring them over there. 
Go get the ladies and, and make it an appropriate situation where some kids can hear the gospel whenever you can. I always joke around like, you know, I get the assist on that one or whatever, even though I ran away from the door as fast as I could. He's like, I'm going to send my daughter over here. You know, send the ladies over there. That's what, ladies are really good at talking to kids. I mean, so are guys. But, you know, in situations, we want to just make sure that we utilize every single thing we can to get all these children that we have, um, you know, that God gives us the opportunity to talk to that we give them a chance to hear the gospel. Because there's such a high percentage, because as such is the kingdom of heaven, there's such a high percentage, if we can match up the ladies with some teenage girls or whatever, there's such a high percentage that they're going to get saved. Whereas with adults, it's really not that high of a percentage. I mean, look, I mean, you know, we want to give the gospel to anyone who wants to hear it, but with kids especially, there's such, you know, there's such great opportunity there. And every kid that gets saved, God will keep their hearts and he will keep their minds. And we know that, look, even if that 12-year-old or 13-year-old, you know, they don't have any power for, you know, their, you know, they don't have any power to get themselves to church, they don't drive or whatever, hey, getting them saved is huge. Amen. Getting them saved, you know, in the environment that that poor child has to go to every day, yeah. where they go into these, these public schools that are teaching them all this trash. I mean, at least they're saved and God will keep them. Right. Ephesians 4, 7 is such a, or Philippians 4, 7 is such a great promise um, for the soul winner. You know, you go and you get some kids saved like that. I mean, you just thank God that that happened. Amen. Because that child, and you're like, well, they're probably never going to come to church. Hey, you know what? They're kept by the Lord now. Amen. They're kept by God now. And that poor kid has to go into this environment, but Jesus Christ has them now. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and he promises us that he'll keep their hearts and minds. And that's just an awesome promise. So look, even in God's wrath, there's nothing we are going to do about this extreme other end that hates the Lord. There's nothing we're going to do about that. Even in God's wrath, these people are there cursing the Lord. And let me tell you something. He's not, he's not trying to get them saved. Right. He's not trying to get those people that are blaspheming pleading him saved because he's already given them over. Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, they're cursing him shows that, like, it's just, it's just wrath at this point. But if you just think about, you know, just even the history in the Bible, like Sodom and Gomorrah, they were there. Paul, they were there. Us, they're here. Even in the end, at the point where it is simply punishment phase. You know, on these people. I'm sure, I'm sure, there's going to be people getting saved in the wrath. Don't get me wrong. But they are not going to be the ones that are blaspheming the Lord. Right? They're not going to be the ones that are cursing out God. So that's the takeaway tonight is these people are amongst us. They've always been amongst Christians. And the key for us is to go out. And again, we're not worried about this extreme end that hates God. It's the vast minority of people. I don't care what numbers they're telling you out there. It is the vast minority of people. We're after... And guess what? We're the vast minority on the other end as well. But guess what? This is the majority. All these people in the middle, they, they just don't know. They don't know. They're caught up in their lives. They have no idea what the Bible says. Some of them maybe would want to know. The children, most of the children, I believe, would want to know. So that's why we should focus whenever we have those opportunities with children to give them the gospel. But a lot of those people in the middle, they will listen. And that's who we're after. And guess what? That's who they're after, too. They're after those people in the middle trying to hurt them, harm them, pull them away from the Lord, get them to be haters of God as well. And that's the importance of us going out, and that's the importance of the two witnesses, that's the importance of the 144,000 during the wrath of God, is doing the same thing that we're doing today. Just being the ones chasing after the ones in the middle, the vast majority of people. Because think about it, we're not the vast majority. During, we talked about population decline this morning. During the rapture, I don't think many economies are going to really hiccup there. I mean, if 1% of the world or whatever is taken out um, at that point. But the point is, we're this tiny group of people, and we're after the same people that the haters of God are after. It's, it's, a, it's literally a spiritual war, the Bible says. All right? It's just a great proof that even in God's wrath pouring out this terrible judgment on people, there, there's going to be people that, don't get, that aren't going to get right. They'll never get right because they can't get right. right 
They literally can't believe, just like the Pharisees and Jesus said. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.